Um, hi, Kelly. Hi. I, as somebody who covered... Hi, Lynn. Hi, Kelly. Sorry, it took me a minute. This <laughs> is Lynn. Okay. This is world-famous journalist Lynn Share, everyone. <laughs> and I thank you for inviting me because, because there are generational differences, and I really wanted to hear what you guys had to say. But as someone who covered the Ferraro campaign back in 1984, before oh, so many of you were born, it's so embarrassing. <laughs> um, we, those of us who not only covered it, but, but cared about women's issues, truly believed that that was the millennium. That, well, there's a female candidate, major part, first major party female candidate for president, uh, vice president, excuse me, and win or lose, it was a huge step forward. And here we are in 2016, there's been one candidate uh, who some would argue was or was not qualified, one candidate for vice president besides Geraldine Ferraro. And here we are in 2016, we might or might not have a female candidate for president. My question to you all is, do, excuse me, do you see this as the beginning of change or the, or the time of change, or do you think this is a one-time thing and we go right back just as we did after 1984 to the old way of doing things? I, I, I'm just gonna jump in, I guess. Um, I, I don't think it's just a one-time thing, but I've noticed that among my writers, at least who you know, like me uh, are in that millennial age group, they're very suspect of hoping too much. Whether you, su whether you um, support Clinton's candidacy or not, they're all feminists and all want to see women in power. And I think, uh, regardless of how they feel about her, they're very hesitant to pin too much hope on her possibly getting elected and the sweeping changes. They all will caution it by saying, you know, this is not going to erase, you know, it's sexism in the workplace. This is not going to erase issues with, you know, wage inequality, which is perhaps more parental inequality. Those are complicated issues um, that are ingrained. And I think already there's a mindset of, in the best possible world, this will be great, but it holds a lot of symbolic value and may not change things on the ground. I mean, you know, getting Clinton elected wouldn't change you know, the massive disparity in our representation in Congress alone, uh, you know, overnight. Um, I think there is, you know, huge, you know, maybe it's cynical, uh, but concern about how much symbolism will do to improve the everyday lives of women. But does it, does it, do you believe, any of you, change the possibility for women running in the future? I'm... Um, I don't want to be pessimistic, but I'm worried that if Hillary doesn't get elected, we do slide back. Because I'm, you know, the, the phrase that runs through my head is, if not her, then who? You know, she's been a senator, she's been in the White House, she's been Secretary of State, she's been working towards this. If she can't get in, who's going to step up and put themselves through that? And who's going to, you know, who are we going to deem is qualified, if not her? And I'll also add to that, um, again, plugging my column this week on the Daily Beast, but because it's part of a serious conversation, which is one of the troubling things that's not discussed nearly enough is the fact that even the women who run and have real shot, either women who run and win or women who run and get close to winning are still often from political dynasties, mm -hmm. even at mm -hmm. the state level. I'm mm -hmm. not just talking about people who, like my great grandfather was president. Right. It's that even people running for attorney general, it's well, often- it's, And it's wives of, of governors wives. and it's wives of- members of Congress in the Senate, absolutely. That, and which is the way women used to get into used power. Used to get into power. Right. And the problem with that is think of the pool where we're limiting ourselves to for women who just run. Forget even then getting up to the presidential level, but the women who run. So especially in the age of student loan debt, we're already starting with a pool of people. Who's going to take the risk if they have a choice between working at Facebook or running for city council and they don't come from a political dynasty? Mm -hmm. I actually think that part of this conversation, which is troubling, is not just that, that we already limit, the process is already limited to people who come from power and money on both genders and both parties. But then on top of that, this idea that in this day and age, I think for a lot of people, it's a big sacrifice to say, I could go work for a tech company, make a lot of money, try to become a female Mark Zuckerberg or Oprah and influence the society that way, or I'm going to go through the slog of knocking on doors at you know, every weekend to try to run for office. And I think for a lot of millennials, I sense that people say there are different ways to have an impact. Oh, I mean, absolutely. I can say anecdotally, I have friends who 
were top in their class at Ivy League schools who didn't want to work on the Hill because you know, you're going to make 20, 30 grand a year and they just couldn't you know, take that over a more uh, lucrative financially way. solving yeah, job. Um, even though they cared about politics and they cared passionately about changing this world, I mean, you know, then other priorities come into play and I don't fault them for that at all. But let me say this, and this is one of my pet peeves kind of in this piece, is that if we want to see the next generation, Olin sat down, but if we want to see the next generation then the Hillary Clintons of the world, the Kelly Ayats of the world, have a responsibility to serve as, as sponsors and mentors. Mm-hmm. And there's, and I mean sponsors and mentors to people who are not named Chelsea Clinton. <laughs> and that is not a slam on Chelsea, but that is just to say the fact that people are celebrating the idea that she might run for office. To me, in this country, we shouldn't be celebrating that. What we should be celebrating is Hillary Clinton saying, I'm already working to mentor the 10 black females who worked on my staff for years they'd make really great candidates. I'm going to give them my Rolodex. I'm going to get Bill Clinton to not just give speeches, but help them on the campaign trail if we want to see the next generation. Because we, that's part of the problem is that we don't see enough of that um, mentoring. And in terms of on both parties, something I've, I've challenged both political parties on is unless you come from a rich family, you probably can't work on the Hill for $20,000. And if we want to see more diversity in who's working in both parties, right, well, but I, I did too, but we're, you know, I don't, I, was, think, I don't think I we're both hungry. 20. <laughs> yeah, I was hungry. But can, yeah. can I just, as, as an encouragement, maybe it's not an encouragement because they're my elk. I, I know that um, there is this bench, though, of women coming up, and they're getting their ex- political chops on city councils and school boards and, and coming along. So I actually am optimistic. And maybe, it, you know, I, I think there is a, a huge opportunity. There, there's increased opportunity for women, and you know, and I come in contact all the time with members of Congress that come from nothing, mm-hmm. um, like Vicki Hartzler from Missouri, who uh, was a, a teacher. Uh, she was actually a home economics teacher, interestingly enough, and decided just to, I don't know, on a whim, run for a state rep and um, won and was a state rep for a number of years and then she got elected to Congress and now she's the subcommittee chairman for the Armed Services Committee oh. and nobody messes with her <laughs> and she's very bright and there are those women coming up through the ranks that I, I get the pleasure and, uh, to, to speak with and to meet and I, it, it makes me hopeful.